Welcome to The Loop Podcast, where we are transforming education in plastic surgery since 2020. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Loop Podcast. I'm Dr. Sanam Zahidi, and today's episode is a resident in-service review of vascular anomalies. This is a supplementary episode and not a comprehensive review. This is a breakdown of key points from previous examinations that may help if you're studying for boards or in-service. I'm joined today by one of our very own core hosts, Dr. Casey Schick. Hey, Sanam. Thank you so much. It's great to go over this topic with you today. While these are rather rare entities, there's always a few questions every year on them. So why don't we try and get everybody a few extra points and get started? Sounds great. So when discussing vascular anomalies, the terminology has historically been pretty confusing because back in the day, descriptive terms were used to label these lesions. So for example, a cherry hemangioma, strawberry hemangioma, port wine stain. In 1982, Dr. Mollikin and his colleagues set up a biological classification system that categorized lesions based on their clinical behavior and cellular characteristics. This classification system was later accepted by the International Society for the Study of Vascular Anomalies in 1996. And based on this classification system, things got very simplified. There are two broad categories of lesions, tumors and malformations. For tumors, or lesions ending with the suffix OMA, or O-M-A, they encompass any lesion with a proliferating endothelium, so they enlarge by rapid cellular proliferation. Versus malformations, they have a stable endothelium and normal rate of endothelial turnover. So Casey, what are the lesions that fall under the tumor category? So under the tumor category, there's going to be three. The first one is hemangioma. The next one is caposiform hemangioendothelioma. And the last one is pyogenic granuloma. And what about lesions under the malformation? So for malformations, we're going to think about venous malformations, capillary malformations, lymphatic malformations, and last, arteriovenous or AV malformations. And as you can imagine, AV malformations or AVMs are high flow lesions, where the other three, we're going to consider them low flow lesions. Okay, now let's discuss each individual vascular anomaly, starting with the most heavily tested topic, hemangiomas. There are two main types of hemangiomas, infantile versus congenital, and the way to distinguish between them is by their presence or absence at birth. Anytime the word congenital is used, it means the patient is born with it. Now, whether that's congenital hand, congenital face, congenital hemangioma, the patient is basically at birth, that condition is present. Versus infantile hemangioma, the lesion isn't present at birth. So starting off our talks about hemangioma with infantile hemangioma, It's the most common benign tumor of infancy. There's a three to one female to male ratio. The vast majority are an isolated lesion. If greater than five tumors are present, there's risk for hepatic lesions. So you wanna get an abdominal ultrasound to look for that. 60% are on the head and neck and about 25% are on the trunk. And the buzzword for this lesion, and it gets tested heavily, is that infantile hemangioma immunostains positive for GLUT1 transport protein versus congenital hemangioma doesn't stain positive for that. And the hallmark feature of infantile hemangioma is that the lesion, like I said before, is not present at birth. And it shows up around two weeks of age, grows rapidly, and then it slowly regresses and it never reoccurs. So if you think about it, the lesion actually has three phases. The first one is the proliferative phase. The tumor rapidly grows until the child turns about nine months of age. Then the second phase is the involuting phase after 12 months where the tumor starts to regress. And the third phase is the involuted phase where it's completely involuted as the name implies. These are all great points, Sanam. It's important to remember that size of the hemangioma or sex of the patient have no influence on the prognosis or the resolution. 90% of these lesions are non-problematic. However, there are complications that can arise. So especially during the proliferative phase where you can see problems. Some of these problems you want to know about are ulceration. As they are in the proliferative phase, they can distort surrounding structures, which include visual and auditory obstruction. And then any of the beard distribution lesions or lesions where a beard would normally grow can cause strider. So you want to make sure you look out for that. 
Not only do you see problems during the proliferative phase, but even after it involutes, it can relieve a residual fibro fatty tissue. This is mixed in with some dense collagen and it can actually cause cosmetic deformities. So Sanam, what would we know or what should we know about treating these hemangiomas? Well, with regards to treatment, observation is usually the main treatment, especially for infantile hemangioma. With conservative measures, total involution can occur. And the way to remember that is in about 50% of patients, they get that at about five years and 70% at about seven years. And by nine-year-olds, 90% of patients have gotten involution. However, if patients are having some of the complications, like you just mentioned, then you would want to resect them. But there are some non-operative treatments that you can try as well. First of all, there's propanolol. That blocks VEGF production, and it's best used during the proliferative growth phase. The important thing to remember for the test with regards to giving a patient propanolol is that there's a potential for severe side effects of bradycardia or hypoglycemia. Therefore, when you want to treat the lesion, you want to admit the kids for close observation to look out for this hypoglycemia. The other non-operative medication you can use is steroids, which again arrests the growth, but it doesn't cause regression of the lesion. In terms of treatment for facial hemangiomas, if it's in the area that's easily resectable, for example, the lip, then you can go ahead and take it out and not worry about anything. But for lesions on the eyelid or cheek, where, as you can imagine, reconstruction is going to be a little bit more complicated, your first line would be to try non-op management with propanolol, for example. As long as you're not causing visual obstruction, then you can go ahead and play with the non-operative managements of these lesions. Great. So next we're going to move on to congenital hemangiomas. So like we mentioned before, unlike infantile hemangiomas, the patient is born with this lesion and it's at its maximum size of the child's birth. So there's two types of congenital hemangiomas, which is categorized by what happens to the lesion after the child's born with it. The two types are there's rapidly involuting congenital hemangioma or rich, which as the name implies, the lesion completely disappears and it rapidly involutes. The difference for the next one is the non-involuting congenital hemangioma or niche, which doesn't disappear by when the child turns one years old. So it doesn't change in size. The only way to distinguish the two is just wait for the child to turn one and see which one happens. Both of these are GLUT1 negative if biopsied, unlike the infantile hemangiomas. And this lesion is more common in the head and neck and as well as the limbs. The male to female ratio is actually one to one, so there's no preference. And these rarely require intervention. Sanam, what's the next tumor in this grouping? Okay, the next one we're going to talk about is Kaposiform hemangioendothelioma. It's present at birth and it doesn't increase in size. It's often large, superficial, and diffuse. The skin overlying the tumor is a deep red purple, tense, and shiny, and it typically involves the trunk and extremities. The most important thing to remember about this lesion is that it's associated with Casabacnerit phenomenon, where the patients have extreme thombocytopenia, I think platelets less than 25,000, because the platelets are getting trapped by this tumor. So you don't want to transfuse platelets on these patients unless they're actively bleeding or prophylactic for surgery. And they can also develop DIC because of this. Since this is a malignant tumor, think the primary treatment is going to be chemotherapy and think vincristin combined with surgical resection. Now, Casey, what's the last tumor we're going to have to discuss? All right. The last tumor we have, pretty simple, pyogenic granuloma. These are usually found on the head and neck. The mean onset is around age seven, and they're prone to bleeding. So surgical resection is the definitive treatment. You just cut it out and you're good to go. And that's about it for tumors. Awesome. So now we're going to move on from lesions in the tumor category to lesions that fall under vascular malformations. They all are present at birth, which separates them from infantile hemangioma, and they all grow proportionately with the child, so they don't regress, and that separates them from congenital hemangioma, which congenital hemangioma either never changes or it rapidly regresses. Now, Casey, can you tell us more about venous malformations? Absolutely. So with venous malformations, think of venous system. So they're soft, they're compressible. There's a blue swelling in a dependent portion of the body. And the hallmark feature is that they grow slowly over time. Some lesions can be hormone sensitive, so you won't even really notice it until the child hits puberty. 
90% of the cases are sporadic. They're most similar to varicose veins. So for people that have learned to treat varicose veins, you think about them in the same way. The first line of treatment, which makes sense, is that we go with sclerotherapy and compression garments. So sclerotherapy is an injection of an inflammatory substance into the lesion, which causes endothelial damage then fibrosis, and then it shrinks the malformation. With these, you want to think of Mafuchi syndrome. That's where there's a venous malformation and then multiple enchondromas. So if you hear enchondromas, you want to look for venous malformations or vice versa. The answer is going to be Mafuchi syndrome. That's it for venous malformations. Great. So next, we're going to move on to capillary malformations. They're dilated capillary venules in the dermis, which darken over time. The female to male ratio is 3 to 1. And the first line treatment is pulse dilasers. There's three syndromes to think of with capillary malformations. klippel turani syndrome, Parker-Weber syndrome, and then Struge-Weber syndrome. So we're going to take them one by one. And the name sounds so fun to say over and over again. The first one is klippel turani syndrome. They are basically capillary malformations of the extremity and varicosities. And the hallmark feature is that there's limb length disturbancy. So usually the affected side has a hypertrophic limb. There's almost always some kind of venous to lymphatic malformation, but with these, you don't have an AV fistula. The second one is a Parker-Weber syndrome. With this, you have all the same things as what a klippel trani syndrome would have, meaning that you have the capillary malformations of the extremity, the varicosity, the limb hypertrophy, but you also have an AV fistula. Now, Casey, what other syndromes should we think about in terms of the third one? So the third one is Sturge-Weber syndrome. So with this one, there's a port wine stain, and this is over the trigeminal nerve distribution. So that's kind of pathognomonic for Sturge-Weber syndrome. Then you need to look for leptomeningeal venous malformations, and then ocular vascular anomalies, seizures, plus or minus mental retardation. So this is a little bit more of dramatic syndrome, but the port wine stain in the trigeminal nerve distribution is going to be your telltale sign. And then you look for the rest of these anomalies going forward. Great. Now moving on to the next lesion, which is lymphatic malformation. It is a type of vascular anomaly that results from aberrant formation of lymphatic vessels, and it most commonly affects the neck and axilla. There are two major types. If you have greater than 5 millimeter lesion, it's a macrocytic lesion. And if it's less than 5 millimeters, it's microcytic. And the treatment depends on the type. So if you have a macrocytic lesion, then you have cysts large enough to be cannulated by a needle. So you can treat them with sclerotherapy. And like Casey said before, with sclerotherapy, you're injecting an inflammatory substance into the lesion that causes scarring of the cyst walls together and shrinks the malformation. The most commonly used sclerosins in this case are doxycycline, sodium, tetradecyl sulfate, and ethanol. Versus, think micro, right? Microcytic lesions. The cysts are too small for you to be able to inject them, so you just treat them with resection. And these lesions actually have a high reoccurrence. Great. Now is the last lesion. So this is an AVM or an arteriovenous malformation. These are pulsatile, high-flow lesions that progress over time. MRI can be helpful to determine the extent of the lesion. Treatment-wise, you want to embolize, so you knock out the arterial component of it, and then you can wide local resect the rest of it. This is the mainstay of treatment. To go forward with this, you want to know the Schobinger staging, which is important. Stage one is quiescent, so it's warm, pink, and bluish stain, and you may see shunting on Doppler exam. Two, there's expansion. So you feel a pulsatile thrill and you see dilated venous networks around. Three is a destructive lesion. So you see ulceration, bleeding, and necrosis. And then four, you have decompensation. And this is when you can see other findings like cardiac failure. And these are all things that you want to look for. And that's it for AVMs. Awesome. So this concludes our episode. Thanks for listening to our quick and non-comprehensive review of the vascular anomalies. If you like our podcast, please spread the word, tell a friend, like us on Facebook, watch this on YouTube, and of course, follow us on Instagram at The Loop Podcast to get in the loop.